Does the poem make a little more sense now? So how do we understand now? You want to take a guess at the steps? Get you involved a little bit? Understand the source material? Or what's the, the author or the source material a little bit better at the time frame? Understand the time frame. Put ourselves in the position of the author. Sure. Understand the culture of the time. Kind of goes along with what you were saying. Okay. Cultures are different. So then we need to understand the history of the time. What is going on? What is influencing their actions? What are the principles that are being taught? Not necessarily their, what are they actually doing? Do we do the same thing? Because today we don't sacrifice animals. So we can't really bring that from the scriptures and say, oh, we have to start sacrificing. Okay? What are the principles being taught? And some culture they still do. Say that? In some area in the world they still do. Some do. Yeah. So then we have to ask, can those principles be applied today? And if they can, then we can apply them to our lives. I want to do an example, and we're going to get everybody to get involved. <laughs> Ahmed, why don't you grab some pens and pass them around? Okay. I'm going to ask you eight questions from a simple story that everybody knows from the Bible. I just want you to answer the questions as you understand the answer to be, okay? No cheating. The answers are not on the computer. Right? They are not there. Don't try to use Google. Okay, first question. Why did Mary travel to Bethlehem with Joseph? She's, what, nine months pregnant or eight months pregnant or something like that? So why would she travel to Jerusalem during that time? It's not easy. It is easy. It's not easy. Put yourself in their position, Hamid. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Why would she travel to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem with Joseph? You're not sitting by your wife. You can't copy off her. <laughs> I have not seen Hamid right yet, so we will wait for Hamid. <laughs> You're making a pally face. Now he's pretending to write. <laughs> now keep in mind that these questions that I'm asking you is going to give you an example of how the book is structured. Okay? These are the types of things that, as I was writing this book, I asked questions like this and had to go in and do the research to get the answers. Okay, did you get an answer there, Hannah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what year was Jesus born? The year of his birth. The year of his Very birth. Very good. <laughs> what year was that? This is a circular argument. <laughs> Did you write something down, Hamid? No, you did not. Oh my goodness, he's on you. He's like, I'm really the thinking this through, right? right I'm really thinking That's this through. That's a tricky question. Yes, I know. Well, I'm sure everybody has thought about that and wondered and probably came up with an answer or heard an answer. Or just thought it really doesn't matter. Or it doesn't matter, and it doesn't really matter. This is None of these questions are going to uh, in interfere with your salvation whether you agree or disagree with the answers. So it doesn't matter how you answer it or what your answers or what your beliefs are. This is just some fun questions to ask. Not as much fun to answer, though. <laughs> <laughs> how much time passed after Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem before Jesus was born? <laughs> I'll tell you how interesting the book's going to be. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, but I think this is the way your brain works. I don't know. He hasn't answered it yet. <laughs> He's still on the second question. <laughs> He's talking about to me. You can write the question. You'll think you're doing the answer. <laughs> I'm looking over his shoulder. I see the line. I'm trying to remember last time I watched him. <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's a perfect example of this. So. A lot of us go back to Sunday school, what you were mm -hmm. taught in Sunday mm -hmm. school on these questions. So, exactly. You know, or yep. what you thought when you were being taught. Mm -hmm. Do you have Do you have an answer there, you know? Always the last one. <laughs> No, we, took, we took five away. <laughs> By the way, that where was Jesus born? Yes, we know it was Bethlehem, but where in Bethlehem was he born? We had Christmas not long ago. <laughs> yes, Christmas was very, very they are all recent. Christmas. Yes, they're all going to be around the same subject. Same story. <laughs> the Bible is all around Jesus. So same subject. <laughs> I'm going to finish that kind of thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, it would be a shame. Oh. This is me in front of physics or calculus. <laughs> no, physics is easy. <laughs> okay, who visited Jesus the night he was born? Now there's an easy answer for you, huh, man? Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Okay, now how much time passed after Jesus was born before Herod ordered the death of the babies? Just two more. <laughs> Why is Jesus called the Son of God? Got you confused there, David? A little bit. <laughs> it's a good question though, isn't it? There was some there is something referring to that somewhere, but I don't remember exactly the reference. I, I believe. Can I answer there, Ahmed? <laughs> You're perfect. Okay. And why did Herod fear Jesus? Now I want to hear some answers. Let's go with the first one. Why did Mary travel to Bethlehem? We'll start over here. Oh, because um, they needed to go register to the town they were from. Okay, how about your answer? I thought it was to pay taxes. Okay, David, what was yours? That would be both, but I said because of the census itself, you have to go back mm -hmm. to the place of your birth and to the pay the taxes. You, uh, the census was to be able to show what taxes you possibly owed, I, I think. That. Something related to that. Okay, what did you have? I just said the census required it. What did you have? To be counted. Okay. Hamed, what did you copy? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the census is why Joseph went. Men, did, men were to be counted, women didn't have to be counted. He could have just oh. gone on his own. She's, can I, can I my, you, can yes, husband? go ahead. Follow her um, husband. So she just went to be a good wife and didn't want to be alone? Okay. All right. So the, the census was to be counted, not for taxes at this time. It was just to be counted. Oh, it was just to count? Yeah. So, number two, what was the year Jesus was born? Let's start again. I say year, year zero. Okay. I put the same thing. David? Two different counts between 50 AD to uh, 50 BC to 50 AD, and in that time frame. That's quite a range. <laughs> no, but I, I don't remember. There was a specific. 
There have been chronological studies that I don't remember. I used to look at okay. that. Can talk you about, narrow it down because a hundred years is? <laughs> let's say <laughs> between twenty-five BC to zero year zero in that range. So he was chronologically. I think he was somewhere around there. Okay. Let's. Uh, it's not exactly David, on zero year zero. David doesn't want to nail down a date. So <laughs> well, I've heard it was the, the year three, but the thing is three eighty. Three eighty, but the thing is, our calendar is based on when he was born. There were other uh, other calendars, so it kind of depends on what calendar you want to use. Well, we're going to use our calendar. Okay, so I I heard I've heard it was three. I don't know why. For our that. calendar, the yeah the, the yeah. yeah. I had four eighty. Four eighty. Zero. Okay. Oh, let's move on. Um, you let's just see. Get all the answers. I You're just want to. I just want to. Hear, we're going to go through the answers. I just want to hear them first. Oh. Tell us which ones okay. are wrong. <laughs> how much time passed after Mary and Joseph arrived? Was Jesus born? Let's start with Ahmed, so you can't hear other answers. The answer, and that's the correct answer. A while. A while. Okay. <laughs> Long, Long enough. enough. Long enough. I just said not very much. Not very much? I literally said not much. <laughs> I'm with you there. Same night. Same night? Me too. Okay. And Hamed is saying a while because the Bible says while they were there, she, the time came for her to give birth. That's exactly right. But we're going to get into that a little more detail. So where was Jesus born? And the answer is not Bethlehem because we all know that. So where in Bethlehem was he born? Hamed? You said not in Bethlehem? He was born in Bethlehem, but I don't want that as but your answer. a specific oh. place within Bethlehem. So, I heard that it was I heard, I, I, in a manger. He was born in the manger? In the hotel, actually. In the hotel? No, not in okay. The no, at the bottom of the hotel, they had the manger. The stable? Something like that. The manger that. is the feeding place for the animals, right. so I don't know that Mary was lying in the manger when she gave birth. Uh, no, the, so you're suggesting yeah, the, the stable? He was put in the manger. He was put in the manger, yeah. But uh, in the stable of the hotel. Okay. Because so they could not get in the hotel, so they were given the uh, stable. They were given a place. Yeah. Okay. What did you have? Outside of the shelter of the building. Outside in a shelter of a building? Outside of the shelter of a building. Okay. No, I, thought even they, I thought they were in a barn. Okay, David? I heard that, well, I thought it was a cave that was... Uh, the the barn area, uh, something like like that it was a cave, cave like uh, natural formation okay. that was attached to the inn. Let's say. Okay. All I know is it had a bunch of animals on it. They stay where the animals stay, which okay. is pretty lonely. Okay. Beatrice. Okay. All right. So who visited Jesus the night he was born? Let's start over here. Oh, the shepherds did. Shepherds. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? The kings. Oh, you said the first Just yeah. the shepherds? Just the shepherds. The kings weren't there yet. David? I would say just the shepherds that night. I didn't think the shepherds came that night. Yes, okay. because they saw Yeah, the angels stars. appeared to them. Right that, I thought it was an angel that came. Okay. No, I said the shepherds as well. Just the shepherds? Just okay. The kings. I had no idea. <laughs> oh, you're, you're saying the wise men came too? Yeah. Okay, how about you? I had an angel. I think Linus was there too. Linus? <laughs> <laughs> what is Linus? <laughs> Alright, how much time passed after Jesus was born before Herod ordered the baby's death? Uh, two years. Because he had I, old babies from two years and old. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought it was three years, but it was around that time. Two, two years. years. Two years? Yeah, two. I, yeah. I just said not, not much time, but I didn't know the two years. Okay. I'm it. Two months. <coughs> two months? Yeah. Depends on the perspective, right? Two years, two months. Yeah. So how much time do you say? Depends how close to the speed of light you are. The okay. Time change with the All right. So time, time travel? Yeah. Okay. What did you have? I had weeks. I figured weeks. it was after the three wise men came and lied to him about what was going on. Okay. <coughs> Why is Jesus called the Son of God? Let's start with you. Because that's what his father called him. Okay. David? I literally don't know. Okay. 
Well, he was, uh, he was, the Holy Spirit was his, and said that he was the one that conceived him through Mary. So God was his literal father. He was literally the son of God. Hmm? I said he was God incarnate, and that's the only way we could understand him, would be to call him son of God. A little bit like uh, Bob said, but very poetically, but I said, didn't have the normal kind of process to have a baby because she said that didn't have, didn't do it. To me. <laughs> they made the conception. <laughs> yeah, it was immaculate. So yeah. that, was, that was the proof that you had. Okay. I just said that he's a human form of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. so if you remember the angels when they went to Mary said that he shall be called the son of God didn't say he will be the son of God he shall be called the son of God okay we'll get into more of that so why did Herod fear Jesus David Jesus would reserve his position because he looked at prophecies and he looked at history too I have my understanding mm -hmm. is and so he knew <clears throat> something of why the wise men were coming through and but he didn't know his understanding was clouded so he got paranoid and my thought is he thought that jesus was going to grow up and overthrow his his government okay oh yeah same thing he he thought jesus was coming to be the king and then as literally take over the king there okay Jeff. you know there have been <clears throat> uprisings before and if you're losing control i'm it He's going to Same. be the king, yes, absolutely. Beatrice? Yeah, I said he was, uh, he, he was a king of the Jews, so he was concerned that he would um, overthrow him. Okay. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> All right, let's look at some in-depth study. And now, understand when I started writing the book, simple questions, simple answers, answers that we have heard our whole lives from Sunday school mm -hmm. or from watching some documentaries or however we heard it. That's where I started. And then I got this aha moment that I needed to get a different perspective, put myself in the position of these people. What's going on during that time? What in history is happening that caused these things? Okay. So let's take a look at why did Mary travel to Bethlehem with Joseph? Okay. Luke 2.22 talks about this uh, purification. It says, and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeon doves. Now the law, oh, I don't have it here. I know I have it. It's coming. All right, so being late in her pregnancy, Mary knew she was going to be taking the child to the temple in Jerusalem after her purification time. She chose to leave with Joseph rather than to travel back and forth. Joseph would have to go back, get her, and they would have to travel again. So they would just simply stay with the family until the time came. Now Bethlehem is just 6.2 miles south of Jerusalem. Nazareth is 90 miles north. Okay, So the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem would have been 90 miles, but the journey from Bethlehem to Jerusalem is only 6.2 miles. All right? Now she's almost ready to give birth. <clears throat> Joseph has to go to Bethlehem. It's only six miles from Jerusalem. Um. She knows that when the purification time is over, she's going to have to present the baby to the temple. Why? Because that's the law. So every, every baby. Every, every male baby that is born is called holy to the Lord and must be presented to the temple. The open first the womb, the first born. Firstborn. It says every, yeah, open yeah, the womb. First the open firstborn. Now remember, she knew she was going to have a male. She knew it was going to be a boy. So she knew she had to get to Jerusalem to present this baby to the temple. 
And that's her decision. She's about to give birth. Joseph has to travel. So she may as well travel with Joseph. The baby will be born while she's in Bethlehem after the purification time is over. And we'll see what that really is, how long that is. She's going to have to present the baby to the temple. Huh. So. I didn't ever saw that. Well, this way. <coughs> <laughs> Do you want to brag on that and tell us why you were right? No, because you're going to have other scriptures that say something else. Another scripture says something else? Yeah. Which one? Isn't that what you're going to do? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the scripture here about later on about the, um, the law where it says what they have to do. But it's in another question. Okay, question two. What year was Jesus born? A lot of you said year zero. A lot of you said, you said three. Mm. Yeah, that's just okay. what I mean. Yeah, there, there was a thing about David gave it twenty-year <laughs> 20 span. David, <laughs> David probably had it right because he gave a twenty-five-year span. <laughs> well, my first span in? of years Did, was a hundred. Uh, <coughs> uh, just to let you know, there is no such thing as year zero. There was no zero number back then. It did not exist. Oh, okay. Okay, they went from one BC to 1 AD. No zero in the middle. So he was either, in your case, he was either born in 1 BC or 1 AD. But why do we use ADs and BC? Anno Domini is Latin for the, in the year yeah. of our Lord. AD, that's what it means. I know, that's why I'm, I, I'm not so sure of that. Yeah. Zero is <clears throat> exactly in the middle between. Yes. Now, that was not actually based on the year Jesus was born. Oh. It it wasn't. It was some, some other royal crazy term thing. or something like yeah. that. So, fact: King Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. So that destroys your 3 A.D. Okay, it's debated by some to say that he died in 1 B.C. But the facts surrounding his successors, his three sons that took over after he died, shows that they took over, took their office in 4 B.C., not 1 B.C. So Herod died in 4 B.C. So Jesus had to be born before 4 B.C. King Herod ordered the deaths of all babies two years and under, according to when the wise men said they first seen the star appear. Jesus' birth must be before 4 B.C. How much earlier is still in question. We don't know when Herod gave the order. Fact, Augustus ordered three census during his reign. Only two of them were before the date 4 BC. One was 28 BC and the other was 8 BC. Now the 28 BC is too early since Pilate, who was governor during AD 26 and to 36, this would make Jesus 49 to 59 when he's crucified. Because remember, Pilate was governor when Jesus was crucified. And Jesus had to be born before 4 BC. So the Bible says he was about 30 when he started his ministry. The 8 BC date would put Jesus at the age of 33 to 43 when he is crucified. That is the time that Pilate was governor of Jerusalem. Okay? So you're saying he had a ministry up to possibly 13 years then? No, I'm just saying depending on when he was born we have a 10-year time period that oh, okay. fell into that he could possibly have been crucified. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> How much time passed after Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem before Jesus was born? It says, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Now, the length of time is unknown. It only says that while they were there, so Hamad, very good. It does not say that she went into labor as they were arriving in Bethlehem. However, based on the previous answer of Jesus being born in March of 6 BC, putting his birth in the spring, it would not have been long after arriving because in those days, people avoided traveling in the winter. So they would not have traveled until winter broke and spring arrived when she's almost ready to give birth. So the 90 mile trip would take about a week or two. So probably not long after she, they arrived, but not as they walked into the city. Yes? I knew about the 
era. I, I, I vaguely knew, but it just hit me now. I, I never again went back. Or, so Jesus comes, and the first consequence is how many children are put to death? We don't know. Back in that time, there probably wasn't a lot of children being born. It's just a small little town, six miles from the major capital. Basically, his generation is wiped out. From that city, not from everywhere, because Herod only ordered the children being killed from that town of Bethlehem. And it was only two years. Yeah, it's only two and under. So we don't know. There, It could have just been ten babies born in there. We don't know how many. And the fact that it didn't make the history books means that they were used to Herod doing this, and it probably didn't make much of a difference. Well, oh, just another 20 kids. No big deal. Yeah. Herod had one of his moments of going, okay, let's do something. <laughs> yeah, this is common for Herod. He killed a lot of people for no reason. He even killed his own son a week before he died himself. So. There's a lot of sadism back then. Just like All right, today. number four, where was Jesus born? Now, Bethlehem, yes, but where? in Bethlehem, most of you have said he was born in some kind of a stable, or he said he was born in an outhouse. No, out, out of the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Just outside of the outhouse. Okay, this one is a long one. <clears throat> There's a lot to this one to understand. Luke says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. It says Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger. Can anyone show me where it says that Jesus was born in a stable? Or that there was an innkeeper mentioned? Well, it doesn't mention the innkeeper, but there wasn't any room in the inn, so... We're going to get to that. Okay. Stick to the question at hand. <laughs> so no, the, the answer is no. Not mentioned. Well, the answer is no. Is, is a stable mentioned? Well, the manger is kind of a... Well, it's a feeding trough. Mm -hmm. But is a stable so, mentioned? No. Okay. Well, maybe it depends on the translation as to whether they use I have checked table. many, many translations. It's okay. not mentioned. I'm going to say the answer is no then. Okay. <laughs> So here's, a, here's my thought process when I read stuff like this. The same thing I just asked you. It says stable. It doesn't say he was born in a manger. It just says he was laid in a manger. I'm sorry. It doesn't say he was born in a stable. It says he was laid in a manger. So I got that backwards. Right? So we know he was laid in a manger. We assume that he was born in a stable because of the manger, like you just said. We assume that there was an innkeeper because there was an inn. All assumptions. No facts to support it. So let's do some history. So what other scriptures in the New Testament use the translation word in, I-N-N? -N? Can you think of any? There Good is Samaritan. one. Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. Ah, okay. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. Through the woods. <clears throat> Luke ten thirty four, the Good Samaritan story. And nowhere else is the word in used as a translation. So let's take a look at these two scriptures and do a comparison. All right. Down below in the red, you have the scripture, Luke 2, 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the middle you have a square and you have the Strong's Concordance. At the top you have the Greek scripture. Now everything is in Greek. So we're going to look at the original Greek word for the word inn. So in the middle it says that the word inn is translated from the Greek word kataluma. And what kataluma means is that it is a breaking up of a journey that is, by implication, a lodging place, a guest chamber, an inn. Let's take a look at the Good Samaritan story there. I think it's in uh, 35, is it where it says? No, it's in 34. 
He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. All right? Up top, you have the Greek. In the middle, you have the definition. It's not kataluma, is it? The Greek word there is pandokion. Okay, so pandokion means a public lodging place. And there, that word there, caravansare, or kan, translated as in. It's a public lodging place. Kataluma is just a lodging place, not necessarily a public lodging place. It just implies a lodging place. So what about the innkeeper? It's only mentioned in Luke 1035 in reference to the Good Samaritan story. It's not in the nativity story. Here is the Greek word for the innkeeper, but it strictly says an innkeeper, a warden of the caravan, sorry, he's the host. So let's take a look at the Greek word kataluma. Where in the New Scripture, in the New Testament, do we see the word kataluma as a Greek word translated? It's in Luke 22:11 and Mark 14:14, 14, 14, the story of the Last Supper. And these are both the same story; they're word for word. So we're just going to look at Mark 14:14. 14, 14. It says, "And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house." The master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? If you take a look at the word guest chamber, that is translated from the Greek word kataluma. They didn't translate it to the word in here. They translated it to good, no, guest chamber. And it's the same definition. It's a lodging place, guest chamber, or an inn. They chose to use guest chamber here. We do the same thing in English. Okay, we use words that are sometimes thought to be the same, but aren't. Close, so close your eyes. I want you all to imagine in your head. Everybody, close your eyes. Everybody's closed. Okay, I'm going to read some words to you, and I want you to picture these in your mind. Hotel. I want you to see a hotel. Motel. Bed and breakfast. Lodge. Guest room in your house. Now, when you heard these words, did you imagine them to be all the same thing or are they different? Oh, they're different. Different. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But they're all lodging places, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Even the guest room in your house is a lodging place for a traveler. Let's, let's put the word kataluma into context now. Look at the two patch, passages, the same word, they should be the same image, right? So if I said motel to you, and then I said motel again, and I said motel again, you're going to see the same image, aren't you? So if I say kataluma over and over again, you should see the same image. The, the point here is that we, we want to compare Greek to Greek. Apples to apples, orange to orange. Okay. okay, we're looking at the Greek translations. In the in the Passover, they talk about the good man of the house. And the Greek definition for that, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Greek to that, but it simply means the head of a family, good man of the house, householder, master of the house. So when we talk about a kataluma, it's talking about a house because the good man of the house is the house, the, the head of the house, the master of the house. And he took them to an upper room. Guest chamber, kataluma, in kataluma, word for word comparison. When you compare the two, a kataluma is a house. It's not a hotel like we understand it. And when I asked you to imagine a guest room in your house, that too could be a lodging place for travelers. B and B. A B and B, yeah. But that's not a family home. Mm -hmm. Airbnb. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's a house. So is it possible then, and I want you to go out of the box here and think, that Mary and Joseph arrived at a house of Joseph's family member. The inn or kataluma here is referring to a guest chamber or a guest room or an upper room, as in the story of the Last Supper, a room from one of his family's houses. And the reason you think that is because... Well, we'll get to why I think that. Why do you think that? So why would she, if she was in, if she's in your guest bedroom, why is she laying her yeah, baby in? That's, that's a good yeah, yeah. Every, male, every good man is called to come and do the census. Good question. Remember, they are, all the family members are coming into town, right? Because they all have to yeah. be there for the census. Yeah, the okay, family. let's not get ahead of ourselves, because I'm sure we thought of that question. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> Partial cutaway of the first century home, B.C. A.D., all right, the black lines there are just cut away. That's where the walls would be. So it's just cut away so you can see the interior. Now imagine... They did 3D renderings back then? They did. <laughs> they had CAD computers and everything. <laughs> I want you to imagine that a census is ordered and everybody has to go to their hometown to be counted. Joseph's family is all there. They're all gathering together in the home. And it's crowded. So you talk about the manger, right? Why would they go and put them in a manger? Right. Well, they didn't have beds then. They all laid on mats on the floor. Where would you put your baby, who's just been born, when it's crowded and everybody's rolling around in their sleep? Would you put him on the floor next to you? Or would you put him in a manger where he's safe? Because they would have to take it from the house. Look in the middle. Every house in the first century BC AD had a courtyard, and in that courtyard there was a small stable to house their domesticated animals. Maybe a cow, some chickens, a donkey, maybe a dog. So there would be a manger with inside the house. Well, there would also be a small stable. <laughs> there would be a small stable to house those, yes. My, my grandfather had it, and I slept in there. He had a house with like that, the manger inside. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he had the, and, and they had the wood kind of structure above the manger. Right. That's where you would sleep. Yeah. But the animals here yeah, would not sleep outside. They would be eaten. Uh, yeah. The, so in France, they have houses like that too? No, that was in, in Nigeria. Oh, in Nigeria? Okay. Out of Nigeria. Oh, okay. Not in Nigeria. Algeria. Okay. <laughs> Nigeria would be a little darker. Yeah, it would be very pale. Nigeria, but the manger, yeah, that was. Uh, it's in the room. It's in the houses. By the way, that was the most um, valuable uh, property: the animals and the cows and the, the, mm -hmm. the, you, you, you make sure they sleep and, and eat well. And the kataluma, being the guest chamber, being full of guests. There's no room to lay the baby without it being injured. So let's take it downstairs, put it in the manger where nobody's going to roll on top of it. Now who visited Jesus the night he was born? The shepherds. They all had it. <laughs> the kings, they said the kings. Yeah, but... No, the kings did not visit the night that Jesus was born. Be a case. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But an angel came too. Well, the, the angels went to, to the, the shepherds. shepherds in the fields. Yeah, the angels didn't appear the night Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The shepherds appeared. Okay, what about the wise men? Maybe it was the same night. It may have been because it was the angels appeared. The, 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 to the shepherds angels appeared to the shepherd the same the shepherds night. Went to, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See it right there. The the angels appeared the same night. It says, uh, blah blah blah. Verse nine. The angel of the Lord appeared. In the glory. Of the Lord. And then today he's born. And the eleven it says today in the town of David his savior right. has been born. So the same day Jesus was born, the angels appeared to the shepherds, and the same night the shepherds went to see Jesus, found him, in the manger. All right, so 
What about the wise men? All it says about the wise men is that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time that King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And if you scroll down there in number 11, where it's bolded, it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. Gives a little more credence to where Jesus was born. Probably born in the house with all the women around. I can just imagine a woman going into labor and all of the sisters and sister-in-laws rush into the room where she's giving birth and the men are out there in the courtyard talking and laughing and being men. <laughs> Baby's born, night comes, they put him in the manger so he doesn't get rolled over on. Who visited you? Okay, this is a continuation. The wise men traveled from the east, probably from Babylon or some other city in the region. They did not leave until they saw the star, so it would have taken some time to travel there and would not have been there the night Jesus was born, but possibly a month or two later. Depending on when they left, we don't know. Okay, it would have taken at least a month. How much time passed after Jesus was born before Herod ordered the death of the babies? And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, we read that. Now we're going to talk about the law. Tell the Israelites when a woman goes, gives birth to a boy, she will be unclean for seven days. This is the same number of days she is unclean for her monthly period. The boy should be circumcised then when he is eight days old. Then she must stay at home for 33 days in order to be made clean from her bleeding. She must not touch anything holy or go into the holy place until the days needed to make her clean are over. So we have 7 and 33 days, so 40 days of purification. All right? So we know that this was not ordered until after the wise men visited, but safe to assume that they did not arrive until after the time of purification of 40 days plus and after Jesus is presented to the Lord at the temple in Jerusalem. So why is Jesus called the Son of God? There's some customs. Okay, you got a question? What was the answer then? At least 40 days later. So it's 40 plus days. It could have been a year later. We don't know when the wise men actually left. No, 40 days is close to two months. So I was right. Yeah. <laughs> it just could not have been earlier than 40 days. He's, you got it. That's right. the only one. Yeah. All right, so we're going to look at a custom. Jewish babies are not called son or daughter, but rather called child when they're born. Whether it's a boy or a girl, it's a child. They don't introduce them as, hey, this is my son or this is my daughter. This is my child. We are children of God. We are not sons and daughters of God. In regards to the male child, the father will train the child in the family business. The father will ensure that the child will have a wife by working with other clans to find a wife for him when he is of age. When the child is 13 years old, the father will introduce him to the clan as his son. Today they call that a bar mitzvah. So what does it mean to the Israelites to be introduced as a son? Okay, the child, now a son, is equal to the father. When they have the bar mitzvah, he's of age, he is now equal to the father. The father has trained him in the family business. Okay, so if the son enters into a contract, the father will honor the contract. The son is equal to the father. The son makes a promise, the father will honor the promise. Now, if you enter the place of business, now that the child has been trained in the business and he is equal to the father, and you need to speak to the father, you must speak first to the son. The son will then determine if it should go to the father, and he will intercede with the father on your behalf. This is what it means for the Israelites when they introduce their child as a son. So it's back in that time period, probably. I'm sure it's changed over time. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it changed over time. Now, we don't know anything about Joseph after Jesus was 12. No, he's never mentioned again. 
So we don't know if Joseph introduced Jesus to the clans as his son. However, it says in Matthew 3.16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. God introduced Jesus as his Son. The Israelites understood this to mean Jesus is equal to God the Father. If Jesus makes a promise, the Father will honor it. If Jesus enters into a contract, the Father will honor that contract. If we want to get to the Father, we have to go to the Son first. The Son will intercede for us. Hmm. It's not a physical thing that we understand why Jesus is called the Son of God. It's a relationship thing. The father seeks a bride for his son among the faithful. And in John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. He's established his relationship as the son. You want to speak to the father. You want to get to the father. You must go through me, go through the cross. So why did Herod fear Jesus? The last question. I have a quick question. Yes. That relationship and 12 years old and all that, does it come from the Old Testament? That is a historical um, research thing from first century AD, BC, where that was their tradition, that introducing the... So it's not a prophecy or a no. commandment? That is the, that is the uh, Jewish tradition. That's just what they did. Now remember, Jesus, God, when, when they're writing all of this, when all of this is happening, God is using their culture to let them understand what he's trying to tell them. They understood the relationship between, or the difference between a child and a son. So he uses they understood the relationship between a father and a son, and when a son is introduced. So God used that to help them understand the relationship where Jesus and God stand. So why did Herod fear Jesus? Well, first of all, we got to look at Herod. He's an Edomian, a descendant of Edomite, of the line of Esau. Herod's family was well positioned in the politics of Rome. Although Herod is not an Israelite, and has no claim to be king of Israel, he married the Hasmonean princess Miriam. And the Hasmonean line was the rightful rulers of Israel. Herod then kills all the members of the royal family, including his wife. What? He needed the Jews to accept him as king, and in order to do that, he had to be Jew. He had to be an Israelite. He's not an Israelite. He's a son of Esau. Hmm. My God, that's a good man. Oof. Jacob is Israel. Esau mm -hmm. is not Israel. What happened between Jacob and Esau? Oh, Jacob, Jacob took the, took stole the birthright. his birthright. Right. Well, Esau kind of gave it away. Yeah, he's a stupid. He, <laughs> he, he was, his stomach was more important to him at the time. Right. So, you know, they... they Marion and Herod had two sons who would have taken the throne because they would have the blood, of the royal blood from their mother. But Herod has them executed in 7 BC, removing any chance that the Hasmonean royal blood will ever rule Israel again. And he secures the throne for his sons and the Herodian dynasty, as short as it is. Uh, wait, but... So he has sons with who? He son? has many wives. Oh, okay. oh. Um, that were well, not. Was one of them his sister or something like that? Uh, I thought. No, I don't think it was a sister. I didn't get into all of that on this study. Okay. I'm just, this is just an example. But I want you to understand that Herod, what he did, his family was actually very political in Rome. His father was with Caesar. 
Now, when they the the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist was this one of his sons, son, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to be accepted by the Jews, Rome had already named him king of the Jews. He married the royal family. So Rome accepted him and named him as the king of the Jews. But he would not have been accepted as king of the Jews if he did not marry into that family by the Jews. So, and as they descended of Esau, it's kind of easy to understand his desire to be a ruler over Israel. Jacob stole the birthright. He's trying to get that back. He wants to be king over Israel. So why was he trying to kill Jesus? Because Jesus was Jewish and he was to be the king of the Jews. That was the prophecy. And he did not want that to happen. And they all got it right. <laughs> All right, Legend of the Unknown God, structured much in the same way. I ask the same type of questions and some of the stories that we read. And I go into depth. And I try to answer some questions. Okay, so if it gets too deep for you, don't get lost in it. Just come on back and ask your questions and uh, stick with it.